Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to our session. Um, this is called Welcome uh, to, sorry, this is called Fixing Real Problems, a conversation about harnessing technology to solve our biggest and most stubborn problems of our time. Um, I'm joined on stage with a number of prestigious panelists. I'll start from this side. Um, I'm sitting with Chris Redlitz, the managing partner of Transmedia Capital, a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. I'm also joined by Nina Tandon, um, the co-founder and CEO of an incredible company called EpiBone, a biotech startup that uses stem cells to regrow damaged bones. I'm your moderator, Jenna Wortham, a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. That's just my family. Don't mind them. Um, <laughs> continuing down the line, I'm with Stuart Butterfield, co-founder uh, co and CEO of Slack, a chat app and productivity startup. And then the... Yes, all right, okay. And at the end of the line, very rowdy crowd. Um, at the end of the line, we've got um, Juke Su, founder of Coalition for Queens, a nonprofit dedicated to improving economic opportunity. So, Woo. yes, thank you. We're really thrilled to be here. This is so exciting. Um, okay, so I did a very short bio, but I'm also going to ask our panelists to talk a little bit more about themselves and their companies and the problems that they're trying to solve and what motivates them. Juke or Chris, who wants to start? Go down the line. Okay. I'm a venture capitalist, but my real mission is, uh, is way outside of the realm of, of investing. Um, I started a nonprofit um, called The Last Mile with my wife, Beverly Parenti, and we co-founded it in 2010. And it's a technology training program for incarcerated men and women um, because we really believe that having a job is the key to <laughs> successful reentry and reducing recidivism in America. Um, we started the program as an entrepreneurship program and Beverly and I, uh, when we started it, we did it ourselves and, and we basically went into prison two nights a week for 40 straight weeks. And, the, and I'd never been in prison before uh, didn't know anybody in prison, but we were really introduced to this issue. Uh, when we started the program, I had no idea about incarceration in America. I had no idea about the extent of the problem. I had no idea that we were spending over $50,000 a year per inmate and recidivism rate across the country is over 60%. Those are numbers that I didn't realize. And when I was invited in initially to give a talk on entrepreneurship, um, the reception that I received was beyond what I could imagine, that there were many men in San Quentin who wanted to start their own businesses, who wanted to be successful, who really had a desire to create a better life after they served their time. So I convinced Beverly, who wasn't necessarily thrilled about spending her weeks in prison, but she warmed up to it uh, very, very quickly because she saw the impact and she's a very powerful woman and a huge support network. She is now the executive director of The Last Mile. But about two years ago, we went beyond entrepreneurship and we started to teach coding in prison, uh, which is not an easy task considering we don't have connectivity and there was a misconception, I think, at the time that you can't teach uh, prisoners technology. Many of the people, the guys in San Quentin are lifers, had never been on the web before. Uh, but today, we have a technology incubator we're building in San Quentin. It's uh, 22,000 square feet. When it's fully finished, we'll have five classrooms. We have a joint venture with the state that we just started last week. Is a web development shop inside San Quentin so private companies can outsource into the prison instead of sending their coding jobs, web development jobs overseas. And uh, we're also expanding in California. We're currently in four prisons. Uh, including a women's prison, Folsom Women's Prison, and we're expanding within California. The, um, the support that we received has been incredible. I know we're gonna talk a little bit about how the community relates and how they uh, contribute, but it's been a phenomenal, life-changing experience for me, and it's become our life mission. Thank you for the work that you do. You know, I think a lot of us are, are interested in how, um, how we can repair the body, or, or history, right? And for me, the history of how we view the body is an interesting topic. 
Um, you know, up until very recently, only maybe about 100 or so years ago, when things went wrong with the body, we didn't really have much we could do about it. Um, and, and as we developed things like interchangeable parts on the assembly line, we started to view our bodies in similar ways. Um, if you were sick, you might need a device or, or take a pill, um, but we were treating ourselves in many ways like machines. Um, but what's interesting to me now is that we're in science, we're learning that we're not just like machines, like C-3PO, but we're actually an ecosystem of many different types of cells living in our own bodies, most of them not even human. And by collaborating with those cells, we can start to think about new ways to repair the body. Um, this is what we do at EpiBone. Um, we, uh, we, we are seeking to address the um, world of skeletal repair. A lot of people don't know this. We have an organ donation crisis on our hands, and after blood, bone is actually the most transplanted human tissue. This is millions of procedures, billions of dollars worldwide, and even now, the only way to get human bone, if you need it for any of these procedures, ranging from cancer to trauma or congenital defects or so on, is to cut it out of a human. And um, considering that we're made of all of these cells that are alive, that are constantly building our bodies and breaking them down every day, why can we not collaborate with those cells to, make, to help our bodies repair ourselves when it, our, our, our injuries overwhelm our capacity to repair? So for me, I think this is a really exciting time because that same idea um, can be applied not just in medicine to help us repair our bodies, um, and help solve that crisis. The, the White House hosted a, a day-long conference about just that topic um, a couple months ago. Um, but also towards making, just disrupting the whole drug development process, helping us understand how diseased bodies work in the lab so that we can test drugs and develop therapies even faster. And what I think is even more exciting is that that same type of technology, biology doesn't belong to medicine alone anymore. If you think about how bioarchitects, I know we have at least one in the audience here, um, and, and people doing work in fashion and, and art um, and a whole range of, of, of um, biofuels, right? A whole range of technologies that don't sound like medicine. I think that um, the next industrial revolution is going to be a really interesting one to watch. Thank you. So I have to admit to having massive... Um, imposter syndrome being on the stage for this, because I'm just representing very standard venture capital-backed uh, for-profit capitalist technology business. Um, but um, uh, I, I, I'm not the kind of person who can take credit for the good work that people using our tool do, so Nina, for We're example. happy users, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, but that's, you know, uh, that's a, a happy side effect. Um, I was raised by pretty hardcore hippies, and I think that a little bit of that ethos has been translated into this um, capitalist system. So I, I worked at, or I was the co-founder and CEO of a photo sharing site called Flickr. And in, thank you. In, in 2005, that was, uh, hi. Uh, 2005, that was acquired by Yahoo. And I had this experience that I think is really common, and not just necessarily in technology, but in, in finance and in government and in other places where there's this incredible group of people like, like who worked in the same part of the same building, like just adjacent to me organizationally. Um, and I think back on that now and what a huge advantage that gave me. So like this is 2006. And uh, one of those people was Jeff Weiner, who's now the CEO of LinkedIn. Another one is Bradley Horowitz, who's a, a VP at Google who handles photos and social stuff. Another one is Andrew Bracha, who's a VC at Excel, who's one of our investors. Another one is James Slavitt, a VC at another top tier firm called Greylock. Rob Solomon is the CEO of Groupon, and I can go on, right? So when I left that, I had these you know, relationships with people at all these different companies, and if we needed something from them, or if I needed a favor, or if I needed um, you know, a, a business relationship with the companies that they now worked for, I had it. And it's, you know, it's not a coincidence, I think, that all of those people I just mentioned were men, with one exception, um, were Jewish, and it's like, uh, including me. And um, again, that's not, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Shanitova. Um, <laughs> um, and again, that, you know, that's not a coincidence. I also, it's not a conspiracy, right? But it is, you know, like attracts like, and people build these networks. And I uh, think one of the opportunities we have with Slack, because we have been extremely successful, you know, we've grown really rapidly 
that we came up in a, a kind of the perfect moment, the capital markets love <clears throat> us, we've been able to raise lots of money, is to widen the network of people who are included in that. Because you know, one of the things you don't, tech entrepreneurs will talk about changing the world, but they won't really talk very much about making a whole pile of money. And it is, Silicon Valley is the engine for wealth creation. If you look at the biggest companies, the most valuable companies in the world, now they're almost all technology companies. They've displaced energy, they've displaced financial services. And if we don't start including a, a broader array of people in that, um, you know, this the same um, same group of people we're gonna is going to rise to the top. And let's look at this. There's a real, I think, at this moment in history, there's a real set of forces that push up people who are above this line and push down people who are below the line. And um, one of our big causes is diversity and inclusion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic, supportive audience. I know, are you sure it's non-alcoholic? Like the bars aren't <laughs> open yet? Um, so we've been doing a lot of work there, and I think we're just still scratching the surface, but that's one of the hopes for this company, in addition to building a, a great tool that is used by wonderful people and um, having an impact in that way, that we're able to kind of broaden that network. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah, and thank you and Slack for you know, focusing on these issues that, you know, just speaking about. Um, I think what Stuart was talking about in terms of um, network and who's participating in the innovation economy and just the tremendous change that's happening right now, the wealth that's being created, the products that are being created. Um, for us at C4Q, you know, that's what we're really trying to tackle. How do we try to expand those opportunities to more people? Um, we're focused on Queens. It's uh, in New York City, about two million people. Um, it's the most, <laughs> yeah, give it up for Queens. Yeah. Uh, Queens is the most diverse county in America, one of the most diverse places in the world. Um, yeah, give it up for diversity. <laughs> you know, and for us, you know, we want to help transform Queens and New York City, propel New York City's tech community so that ultimately it's reflective of everyone in our community. And, you know, it's very reflective. Um, you know, we want to help train and create pathways out of poverty. Um, so that more people can access these things. We uh, teach adults in poverty to code, help them get jobs in tech, and also create these future products and companies. Um, it's very measurable and tangible, so going through our program is completely free. Um, last year, we increased people's income from 18000 starting out to $85,000 a year afterwards. Um, really... Lucky our graduates are working at companies, whether it's Pinterest, have a great partnership with them, or Kickstarter. And at the same time, it serves an audience that's reflective of our community. So it's half women, 60% uh, black or Hispanic, half immigrants. And, and that's really just the demographic breakdown of Queens in New York City. Um, and so, you know, we want to help create uh, uh, the future tech community as reflective of that. And most importantly, beyond gender and ethnicity, we're really trying to think about who has access to technology um, in terms of economic opportunity. Um, most New Yorkers don't go to college. 65% of New Yorkers don't graduate from college, and most Americans don't. And, and you know, if you want to take a moment and think about that statistic, right? Like, you know, I think I'm very open-minded, care about diversity and inclusion, but at the same time, all of my friends and generally people I know went to college and went to like a few select universities, but most people don't, right? That's your highest determinant for, you know, economic income. Um, if you never go to college in New York, your average lifetime income is $27,000 a year, right? So how can we think about, you know, as technology is rapidly transforming all these different sectors, you know, we talk about disruption of workers or industries, thinking about all these people out there that may be incredibly talented, but may not have access to these opportunities, and really creating that transformation from that outcome to you know, $80,000, $90,000 a year, or a pathway to middle class. You know? And for me, you know, um, I, I, I helped start this five years ago with Dave, my co-founder. He's, he's in the audience right now. Um, thinking about it, you know, I was in the military before this, and um, moved back to Queens originally, wanting to create a civic tech company you know, for-profit company, and just saw how much there was a huge disconnect between my home community and the technology transformation that's happening. Um, and, and looking at those that don't go to college, and I was in the military, you know, all the soldiers I served with 
you know, never went to college, right? But some of the hardest, you know, working, smartest people I've ever met, you know, were able to be really successful because they got the training and access to networks to do these things. So similarly, if we're thinking about inclusion, diversity, and tech, you know, we want to try to think about what are other ways to open that for, for more people. Excellent, thank you. That was great. Um, what I love about this collection of pe people up here is that everyone is tackling very different types of challenges and is focusing on very different types of things. Um, but I'm also wondering, I mean, when we say that we want to fix big problems and real problems, do we have a sense, and I mean we collectively, people who work in a problem-solving industry or even just as a society, do we have a sense of, do we all agree on what those big slash hard problems are or do we have a sense of what they should be? Anyone? I bet there's a couple that we can <laughs> all agree on. I mean, criminal justice reform would be um, a big one. Um, <coughs> equal uh, opportunities would be another one. So um, climate change would be another one. And those are ones that, that where technology is more or less applicable. But you know, there's, like, there's a broad set of challenges that we would all identify as, as the biggest ones we face. I would also add to that the um, escalating healthcare costs worldwide as the populations age and the world globalizes. I would agree. I mean, obviously, I'm very uh, close to the criminal justice reform, but you know that has an impact on the economy. Obviously, the economy is a big issue for us today, um, creating jobs. Matter of fact, there's a data point saying that by 2020 we'll have a shortage of uh, software engineers. So that's a that's a a good opportunity. Um, so we're talking about shifting legacy jobs into something new, and I think that's a big challenge. You're taking some sort of status quo and moving it into a, sort of a new economy. Um, and frankly, that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're taking people out of their comfort zone, teaching them something new to be productive and additive to our society. So, you know, it's definitely the economy and criminal justice sort of interweave together somewhat. Yeah, I think these are all, obviously, there's huge problems facing, like, our society and communities right now. The jobs and income is, is a huge thing. I think tying into just how technology is changing cities and how quickly things are changing and who feels and how communities feel if they're participating or not. I mean, one thing is the very tangible, who has access to these jobs and these opportunities in education. But I think you're looking at different cities, whether San Francisco or New York, and the impact that the growth of companies are having and anxiety that's causing on you know, housing or commercial space, I think is actually tied into a much kind of larger issue about you know, access and how people feel about the change that is occurring. And I think that's a harder kind of issue to tackle with, whether it's affordable housing or transportation, but it's all like kind of nested in some way in terms of the societal transformation and technology changing, but other things aren't changing quickly enough to like adapt or meet those opportunities, those yeah, problems. Yeah, I too have seen that. I mean, we have a biotech company and we're based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and you know, Brooklyn is a borough that's really being, it's just being transformed. And um, in a way, there's a parallel almost housing crisis that's developing for where people are gonna live and also where businesses are gonna live. And um, we feel that, you know, in biotech, for example, there's just so much, um, if you wanna have uh, if you want to have foster a biotech hub, let's say, where like they like the Bay Area has done so well in the Boston area, you think, well, where are those companies going to live, and what are all the um, intersecting issues that would impact that? Whether it's something like zoning um, or uh, things like that that you don't expect to intersect with that with that issue. So it's interesting, you know. I think it's going to be a real challenge for us uh, and our urban planners to make sure that we keep. The, those, those two changes in, in step with each other. We need our businesses to support our people and our people to, to live in symbiosis with our businesses. Yeah, that leads me to um, the next thing I wanted to, to have a conversation about, which is that, you know, since we have perspectives here from within and beyond the valley, the Silicon Valley, um, I'm really interested in thinking through and interrogating how 
the culture of Silicon Valley and big tech companies that we all use all the time, you know, and how they shape the priorities about what we consider to be the things we need to work on for the future. I mean, I have spent as much time as anybody else watching hoverboard videos on Vine and YouTube, but is that the thing, the big change that we need to see in our lifetime? You know, I feel the same way about driverless cars and um, new ways to outsource laundry and meals. I mean, these things are very cool and interesting, but sh should we be thinking bigger? Well, as an investor, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> we, uh, there are some fundamental shifts in how we operate. I mean, Slack has fundamentally changed how we communicate internally in your company. Um, Facebook has fundamentally changed the way you connect with people. So there are, you know, sort of incidental um, companies that are created that you think they're not that important. In the midst of that, entrepreneurs are, f are fixing human need problems. Um, the thing that it's really touched me is that when I, when I started this program with Beverly, we really didn't know if we'd get a good reception within the Silicon Valley community. We, we weren't sure whether we'd get support. Um, frankly, we weren't sure whether it was the good thing for us to do professionally because it was pretty controversial. I'll have to tell you today that the amount of support that we received from volunteers, from large companies and small, we have HP and Adobe and LinkedIn and uh, Microsoft participating. Um, you know, Stuart and Slack, Stuart has been in San Quentin talking to the guys. We have 90 volunteers just in San Quentin alone. So um, there is definitely a social consciousness in the Valley and that really starts with the leaders, but it, it trickles down to throughout the community. So um, unless I experienced that, I would have never known that and would have never anticipated that. But um, there is a, a, a clear vision and purpose with many, many companies that are being created today. And uh, again, it's just been an amazing experience for me to be part of that. Yeah, it, it, you know, I was, you, we were talking about diversity of the people that you, you, you choose to serve. And in our case, when you think about personalized medicine, you need to make sure that your approach is going to work for everyone. Um, but you also got me thinking about the diversity that we seek, you said, on all axes, right? Um, and I'm thinking for us, um, I, I was struck because I think our investor group represents a, a, some diversity compared to what you might see for typical companies. Um, we're developing a therapy that has a really long time horizon should it um, be approved. A lot of hurdles in the way between where we are now um, with animal test subjects and moving towards clinical trials and so on. And so in a way, we track a certain kinds of investors that are more like social impact investors or um, people in the venture philanthropy world. <laughs> These were words I didn't know went together until um, we started Epibone, you know. And it, to me, it's really heartening to see that um, the world of um, venture capital and philanthropy are kind of um, also um, moving in a, in a positive direction towards handling some of the, the tougher problems. Um, and we're really grateful for that, that type of support. So we've, we've noticed that there's been a bit diversity of, um, of types of funders for our project, everything from grants to um, professional investors. Yeah, I'd say, so it's, uh, you should be careful not to conflate tech in the broadest sense with like just Facebook and smartphones or something like that because um, technology is, you know, if you think back throughout human history, things like spoken language is a technology, written language is a technology. And there's a set of changes that started maybe like in the 1850s where we saw much more rapidly accelerating technological change like the railroads and the telegraph and then radio and television and jet travel. Um, and it's transformed who we are as, as human beings. You know, like uprooted people from a lot of traditional cultures, people moved to cities. Um, and I think of technology as something which increases the choices and maybe is an amplifier. You know, you, you compare digging a ditch with a shovel to digging a ditch with a backhoe. Everyone would choose to dig a ditch with a backhoe. But you can still apply it to different purposes, right? Like there is no, um, I don't think technology comes attached with a, with a moral direction. So you can use a backhoe to dig mass graves or trenches for trench warfare or something like that. And then there's also the more prosaic and benign uses of, of ditches. Um, I, 
I wouldn't want to live in a world where we said people shouldn't invest their resources or their time or energy in making frivolous or silly applications. While that's going on, though, I think there is like really significant technological changes. Like we just saw solar power under three cents per kilowatt hour for the first time, and I, I didn't think that would happen for another 15 years. Um, and, and that's going to have a pretty profound impact on, on the like the shape of our our, our countries. Um, so it's a tough one because I, I think part of um, what gives us the good results that we want is that unfettered exploration of all the possibility space and people kind of trying out different things. Yeah, yeah, picking back off that, you know, it's the most enabling thing, right? So, you know, talking about what's um, being created, whether it's useful and to whom, et cetera. But I think what's beautiful is that, you know, it's like a individual determination almost. Well, not, not I mean, it's built in teams and communities and companies, but um, we're able to create ideas and products and companies that we find valuable in our own life. And I think, you know, who's to say what is a frivolous product or not, although I do think there's a huge need and a lot of needs aren't being addressed. And that is why I think it's important that we have more inclusion and diversity and that there are more entrepreneurs from different backgrounds along those different axes, whether it's gender, ethnicity, or social economic background, because I think their perspective and what they want to create and the issues that they're trying to tackle and solutions would be, would be very different. It occurs to me that Twitter is actually an amazing example of all of this in one thing, because when it first came out, it was, what did you have for breakfast today? People would criticize it, it was a ridiculous thing. And then on, on the, like the negative side of humanity and culture, there's a lot of um, harassment and there's a lot of hate, and we talk about that quite a bit. But on the other side, you know, Black Lives Matter wouldn't have happened without Twitter. And the Arab Spring, and there's a lot of political movements that, that it enables. So it's, it is like an amplifier for both our best and our, our worst tendencies, but gives us a lot more facility to, to, to impact the world. All great points. I mean, you know, Chris, I love the anecdote you shared about feeling a sense of um, social consciousness from within the investors and entrepreneurs that you interact with. And GK, I really appreciated your point about um, acknowledging that there is, and Stuart, you made this point as well, but that there is a place for things that seem kind of light and I guess fluffy at first to evolve and, and take on a new role. But but one thing I am curious about though, are there are there clear blind spots? I mean, are there areas or even ways of thinking that we should be hoping to see or things that we kind of would, would benefit from emerging? Has anything come to mind? Definitely. <laughs> um, I, think, I, think that's, I, I think that's true. I don't know if I know all the blind spots, but um, having, I think, different perspectives on, on it is, is, is really important and different voices are creating the products, you know? If all the products and companies are created by, you know, a small segment of our society, what, how they choose to think about it or create, it just, I think it's like a axiom almost, like you're not gonna be able to solve all the problems that are out there, you know? So, um, but there's, there's such a range of issues, I mean, I know there's been a lot of change, but I feel like we're just at the very beginning, right? Obviously, long, long history in terms of different technologies, but things are gonna continue to change, and I think there's so many large issues out there that are waiting to be tackled, you know? Um, yeah, that's not very specific, but I feel like I encounter problems all the time that <laughs> more people should be tackling with these things, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important whenever, you know, I've gotten a chance to mentor startup teams through my work at Columbia Business School, and I often ask the teams, you know, what's your target market, your target market, what are they, what does that composition of those people look like? And then ask yourself, well, what does your leadership team look like? You know, what about what do your investors look like? You know, and slice in the different ways that are relevant, and then even maybe ask the question, is that target market diverse enough, right? And um, I think I'd love to hear those questions be asked of, of, of teams and, and in both directions, teams of their investor groups and just see, you know, are there giant mismatches there? And chances are, if there are, there's a chance that there's an underserved community at work that can be uncovered. And, and, and in my experience, once people realize that there's something missing like that, it's an exciting opportunity to grow in a new direction. Yeah, it was just, you know, as far as blind spots go, it, you know, whenever you introduce a ne te new technology, you're not mm. sure what the impact's going to be. And it's, um, there was just an announcement recently that Facebook and Google, Microsoft, IBM, and Amazon create a consortium around best practices for AI. Because we don't really know where, you know, AI it has all these different applications, potentially. What happens when that 
that's actually put in practice? How does it impact the workforce? How does it impact what we're currently doing? So to be conscious about innovation and the impact of that, I think, is super important. Um, so to me, that's just one example of that. I think there's also some things that aren't necessarily blind spots, but are just going to be on a longer time cycle, because there is no approval process for someone to release an iPhone game. Whereas if you want to, and there are many people um, engaging in really interesting projects in education, in healthcare and medicine, in energy, and there you have you know regulatory environment that you have to deal with. And you also just have, uh, you know, there's more at stake and, there, and there's a larger impact. So I think we'll see over the next decade, the next couple of decades, much larger changes that just, they're operating on a different kind of time cycle. Mm -hmm. um. Great. Well, you mentioned a word I wanted to, to segue into the next question with, but you said the word regulation. And since we're here and we're you know at the White House and it's the first South by South lawn, I thought it'd be interesting to sort of to talk about kind of the evolution of how technology companies work and deal with the government. And you know, as a tech reporter for a long time, you know, you'd ask startups about sort of the their roads to innovation or kind of how, why they did things the way they did. And they would often say, well, we have to sidestep regulation because that's like kryptonite to innovation or progress or it's the antithesis of getting things done. And I'm, I'm curious to you know, hear from our panelists sort of what your experiences have been and if we've come, you know, that for me that was about five years or so ago that I was having those conversations. And I'm curious to hear from you guys if the thinking has evolved or changed since then. Well, I can speak directly to that. Um, first of all, I think it's so cool that we're doing this. Um, to having this event on the, on the White House lawn, it's, it's pretty amazing. So uh, kudos for everyone for putting this together. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> just looking at the Oval Office, just cool to be, at least be on the outside looking in. Um, <laughs> but um, we're building a technology incubator inside a prison. That means you have to have a lot of cooperation with government. And um, so for us, really, it was, it was not that we couldn't do it, but it was we had to follow a process. And I think that's the big thing that um, you have to sort of get in your head. And it's hard when you're in Silicon Valley and innovation happens every day and, and we're, we're looking going to zero to 60 um, overnight. That doesn't happen in government, and, and there are reasons why. Um, and I appreciate those. So for us, it was a matter of understanding the internal mechanism, getting champions inside, building trust. And for us, really, it was trust of the guys in the yard. You know, I mean, when you think about you're going in prison, you have to have trust at the very fundamental level, but then trust in the administration, trust in the government, and then just operate and begin to sort of evolve that. So if I said to Jerry Brown in 2010, Jerry, we want to build a technology incubator in San Quentin, he would have said, there's the door, see you later. Um, today, Jerry Brown is one of our biggest uh, proponents and, and um, endorsers of what we're doing. Um, um, Scott Kernan, who is the Secretary of Prisons, has been in multiple times. Um, Gavin Newsom, who's Lieutenant Governor, um, you know, all of the people that make those decisions now trust us and, and as of last year, we started to get funded by the state. So when we started, we self-funded the program, then we got some donations from foundations and so forth. But the state of California now is the primary funder for our program. So it's moving from really sort of questioning and concern about disruption to a trust factor. And also, to be honest with you, it starts even further beyond at the top. You know, um, President Obama is the first sitting president to ever visit a prison, which was kind of mind blowing to me when he did it this year. Um, he signed an initiative to outlaw uh, private prisons in prison. He's, uh, he's committed over 500 life sentences. That's more than between when Calvin Coolidge was president to now. Um, so he's done some really amazing things and we had the opportunity to uh, host Valerie Jarrett who is senior advisor to President Obama about a month ago and she came in San Quentin. So it's that type of education understanding that you need. People are saying, hmm, wow, this works. So um, it's a long answer to your question but it's starting at a very fundamental level, um, having trust and a plan and operating to your plan and treating people right and making sure that uh, the right people get credit as well. 
Um, and then you can get to where we are today, where that we've had uh, incoming from 21 states in in our country who want to have our program. And for us, we're still, you know, we have 14 employees. So it's like, you know, it's still small, but uh, we know that in the future that we're going to be able to address all of that demand, but it really starts at that very fundamental trust level. Great. Yeah, I love that word trust. You know, I think that word comes into play in, in our field in so many different ways. Um, you know, we have patients that write us emails every day talking about the conditions that they suffer and asking if there's a way that we can help them. And, and that's a very different dynamic than what you see in more widely in the industry with patients and how they feel towards large um, in biopharmaceutical companies with, you know, overgeneralizing. Um, and so there's this idea that um, patients sort of see um, scientists like us in small teams that are working to help them sort of as being on their side. And that's, I think, a really important thing. Um, and then when we think about regulation, um, you know, we're, very, we're on the other side. Of, in, re in terms of regulation, we think, we want to make sure that we don't rush in and try and help people before we're sure that this is going to not, not hurt them, you know? And, and what precedent do we have if instead in the past therapies looked like pills and devices and now we're moving to a world where therapies are alive? <coughs> Wouldn't you like to know that that science has been done in a good way um, before that's being tested in you? And so I think that we find ourselves on the same side as the regulators in terms of wanting to get that right. No one, we all want to see this move forward. We want to see no one get hurt along the way. And so I think that's, um, that's a really good relationship there. Um, and then when I think, you know, okay, well, what's happening more widely in biotechnology right now? Okay, it's, it's pretty easy for us to have consensus about the idea of living technologies being used for human therapies. Um, but more widely, this question of tinkering with biological material, I think, is one that's very important for us to address. It's one of these big issues coming up online for us as biology becomes the new data, and it is becoming the new data. We can now, we're at a Gutenberg moment in terms of not being able to just read the human genome, but also cut and paste to the genome, right? And so if we think about cells as living factories and we can now cut and paste, and there's been a programming language released for um, bacteria this year by MIT researchers, okay, what does that mean for the world, right? And who are our allies, you know, in terms of thinking it through? And you brought up the Victorian internet, you know, our experiences with <laughs> the telegraph and, and, and so on and how that transforms society. We got through that. Um, and now we have questions like is tinkering for genetic material for the sake of of, of humans or in plants and um, yeast and bacteria, is that equivalent? Is tinkering with it for the sake of therapy or for the sake of education, right? Or for the sake of entertainment, the same, right? And is, if there's more bacterial cells than human cells in our body, and if you can take the human cells out of our body and grow a new body part, put it back in our body, and our cells don't know the difference, what are the boundaries of the human body anyway? And what does it mean to say that we're human, right? And regulation is going to come into play in helping us sort through these issues. And I think that we'll have allies in places that are unexpected to help us deal with that. Um, I love the, seeing the rise of the community biohacking um, groups that you see popping up all over the country at GenSpace, BioCurious in the Bay Area. I mean, they're everywhere. And I think um, we've seen government agencies reach out to those communities as kind of a neighborhood watch. And I actually see that with a, as a positive development when we think about, you know, what do we want our neighborhood watch to look like for bioterror and, and big questions of food security, um, where we don't really think of biology as traditionally residing. So I think, you know, within medicine, I'm, I'm very heartened with what I see happening in regulation as we try and move this forward. But I'm also, um, I wanna make sure we pay the proper attention towards as biology no longer belongs to medicine alone what that's going to mean in terms of our regulations keeping up with that. Anyone else? I think uh, Nina made a great point, and I want to underscore that, that I think the amount of change that we went through over the last 10 years is something that's going to take a couple of generations to unpack. Like, I think it is the internet um, as a, a, an additional appendage of everyone's body is a transformative technology. And we're not going to know how to deal with that for a couple generations, just in the same way that it took us generations to deal with steam power. It took us generations to deal with the telegraph and the telephone and television. Um, as for the regulatory environment, I think you know, it's easy to cherry pick examples of things that seem ridiculous, especially out of context. But we mostly 
benefit, and we mostly appreciate the benefits of regulatory environment. Like the FAA has made commercial air travel safer. There's no, yeah, regulation, <laughs> regulators. A couple people from the federal agencies here. The FAA, all right. Uh, um, you know, at, at the same time, I think you have to be wary of regulatory capture and, and the um, lobbying efforts of incumbents to use regulatory systems to protect monopolies. And, you know, I think the EpiPen um, situation is just as much a, an interaction of misfunctions or malfunctions between the patent office and the FDA as it is, like, the fault of some evil, grinning, capitalist, backroom conspiracy. Um, and, and that will happen, and we have to kind of accept that as the cost and just be committed to continuous improvement. And every, uh, this is only my second time ever in Washington, but I have been impressed with literally every single federal employee that I met uh, and their commitment to what the purpose of their organization is. And it's just not easy, you know? Like this is an organization of six million people um, and trying to deal with some of the most complicated things in the world. So I, I think that th there are places where we can, you know, at the margins say that it inhibited innovation, but broadly speaking, it's, it's a, to the benefit of people. Yeah, and just, you know, I think trust and is, is really important, what Sue was saying as well about how, like, there's obviously an important role of government for, for a lot of these things. And going back to what Jenna was asking about, you know, how tech companies approach this, it's hard for me to say, but um, if we're talking about hard problems and real problems, I think a lot of the hardest problems, you have to work with government and you can't do things independently, right? Like, whether it's healthcare or education or housing. You know, it's really hard as an independent company or entrepreneur to completely ignore those things and create solutions because it affects so much of society and life. So if, if one wants to tackle those hard problems, that, that kind of trust and ability to work with these different kind of s stakeholders is really important, you know. And we see that a little bit in our work. Um, you know, I think we're, we're really lucky. We have amazing backers. You know, our three main backers are giving them a shout out, Robinhood Foundation New York, Black Zone, and Google for Entrepreneurs. And you kind of see they're across business, philanthropy, and technology, right? And we also work with the city council and government as well. And it's how do you work with these different perspectives on creating solutions that actually move things forward. And ultimately, in terms of what we're trying to do, you know, getting people into, involved in tech, you know, having the trust of the technology industry Ultimately, the people we're training become, you know, ultimately it's not philanthropic or charitable because they become the peers and co-workers of people working in tech companies. So that trust and ability to not only work with, you know, our, our larger tech community, but as well as with business and the philanthropic community to create those shared goals for action. I think doing that on a larger level is how to solve these larger hard problems that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, Nina, I wanted to touch on a comment that you made about, you know, you were talking about seeing the, the emergence of biohacking groups and these community organized groups that basically just approach an issue or problem in science and then just kind of, you know, work around it or hack or they just experiment and they come together. And I, f I find that really encouraging just that we're starting to see the emergence of new frameworks for thinking through some of these big problems. And I, I guess, you know, since we're, you know, we're all everyone on stage is, is affiliated with a tech organization in some way. I'm, I'm interested to hear if you guys think that have we reached the limits of what, you know, working with the tech industry can do? I mean, should we be thinking beyond the entrepreneurial model? Is it more working with nonprofits or kind of more community organization groups? Or is when we look ahead, I mean, how do we need a new framework for thinking through some of these big problems that we're trying to tackle? Hmm. Well, actually, you know, I just wanted to build just it sort of dovetails in because I think they're a role for not just government in terms of regulation, but in terms of what we're doing also in terms of tax incentives, because part of the, you know, we're located in Brooklyn in a place where, um, you know, we're eligible for a biotechnology tax credit and where we're eligible for um, tax credits for helping to create jobs. And, um, and that really has made a huge difference for us in our, in our community. And, um, I think there, that that's another place where government can play a role and, and help um, foster some of the economics there. Um, yeah, sorry? <laughs> Wait, can you just repeat the last part of your question then again? Well, I guess I was trying to raise the question of if we should be thinking about other frameworks beyond, beyond the entrepreneurial model, because it's so based on scaling and returns right. and a, yeah, a very specific institution. 
So I, I think we need to weave the fabric of entrepreneurship into almost every, the way we approach <coughs> everything, whether it's, um, you know, uh, school, thinking entrepreneurially and thinking about um, creation of jobs, transitioning from thinking about ourselves as we're going through education as information consumers into information creators and critical thinkers. And I think it's a reframe that um, does sort of, um, that I like to see happening that's um, almost imbuing entrepreneurship into uh, everyday life. Um, I'd also love to see the um, almost decommercialization of all commercial activities occur in parallel to say something a little provocative, right? I think there's the role to be, you know, to think about, well, what is your mission at all moments of the day? What is, what are you, what's important to you in terms of your values and how does that express itself in every moment um, in your life? And then what does that therefore um, push you to think about, about choosing? And so um, I'm seeing both of those trends happening when we see people choosing access over ownership of property, when we see Kickstarter proving business models for altruism, when we see um, you know, uh, philanthropists popping up that are mixing models with venture, you know, venture capitalism, like the Breakout Labs Foundation, that was our first investor, um, from Peter Thiel's foundation, or from the New York City Partnership Fund. We've seen different people working together, and so what I think that really on a meta level is saying is that entrepreneurship can be sprinkled in to the fabric of, of our day-to-day -day life, and, and so can a certain almost high-mindedness um, be um, sprinkled as well. <laughs> I was gonna just uh, interject. Um, as of last Monday, we actually are in partnership with the state of California in a business. We launched the, the first uh, web development software engineering um, outsourcing facility in the country behind prison walls. And so it's, as I said before, it's trust and approval in that time. We're in business with them to many, to a degree. We're um, uh, with the uh, Prison Industry Authority, Cal PIA, and led by Chuck Batillo, who's the general manager. Um, we now have a web development shop that private companies can outsource business to the prison. And so that is uh, sort of a different twist on things. It's, it's actually now even uh, getting a closer relationship the business is run by us. They're basically our landlords to many degree, uh, to a great degree, and the, the guys in the program actually are on our payroll. But what's great about it is that now they're going to segue into jobs, but they also get to create some sort of uh, reserve for when they get out. Because in California, if you don't have a job and you haven't been able to generate any, any money in prison, you get a, uh, uh, basically a uh, $200 and a bus ticket and you're gone. So this is gonna create something that is much more sort of fundamental and, and create a long-term impact of reentry. But the fact that we can actually have a public-private partnership, and I would, have, I would have scoffed at that 10 years ago, but the fact that we have this partnership and it's working is really encouraging to me. Excellent. Yeah, I think thinking about frameworks is really interesting. Um, you know, if you're a technology company, you're creating platforms and frameworks for how, like, you know, like Twitter or Slack, how people on it interact, right, and how engage and decide or organize, et cetera. But, you know, it's so much harder to do that in real life, right? <laughs> um, and I think it's, I, I wouldn't want to put in opposition, like, new frameworks versus entrepreneurship. I think it's both important. Actually, you have to be, like, really, really entrepreneurial to create like a new societal or new societal frameworks to tackle problems. But I think like some of the hardest problems, whether like housing right now, whether it's in New York or San Francisco, if you can't build it, like what are the frameworks you need to create to be able to achieve that? And there's these obvious failures right now that require new frameworks um, or education, you know? And I think, I, I think that's important. I wish I knew what the solutions were, but like that, that that's actually, yeah, that parallels is, 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 are really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Stuart, I have a kind of a specific question for you, although I, anyone f should feel free to jump in if they want. But I, I'm excited that you're on this panel because Slack has done a lot of really interesting work about around diversity and transparency and just sort of addressing it very head on. And I read an interview with, the, with Leslie Miley, who I think is here, who's the director of engineering at Slack. He said in an interview that Silicon Valley is hostile to diversity. Um, and he went on to sort of elaborate on how historically 
the tech industry and the tech world has benefited white men at the exclusion of women and people of color. And that has both shaped sort of how we think about the problems that are urgent to us, whether harassment on Twitter is a big deal or not. Um, and also, GK, you mentioned before, uh, you know, talking about wealth, or you, you mentioned this, Stuart, actually, as well, but, you know, talking about wealth disparity and sort of the, that the, the tech companies that are being created right now are, they're minting and they're so much money and sort of the people that have access to that money is still very racially um, disparate. You know, there's still a, a, a gap there. And so I'm really interested in kind of what Slack has done. And you've, you've spoken very openly about trying to hire people of color and sort of putting them in prominent positions um, and making that a part of the culture of your company, which is, I mean, you were kind of saying you have uh, imposter syndrome up here, but that is actual and very interesting and tangible change that does affect the Valley. Uh, and it's a big deal. And so I'm curious to sort of hear you talk a little bit more about making that decision and embedding that in your company and, and what people can learn from that. Sure, so I think we started when we were, um, and I think this is the, the trick, as it were, um, when we were pretty small. So I think it's much harder to change things when you have thousands and thousands of people than when you have dozens of people. And um, you know, I get, uh, there's one thing, that it, it's not that I'm hiring women and people of color and putting them into powerful positions. Like we actually, Leslie is there, director of platform engineering. Um, and he was the best person for that job. April Underwood's right there, VP of product Slack. Um, and she, you know, there, there are arguments that diverse teams will produce better business results and, you know, and I could say like, oh, maybe if we have a woman in charge of product, then she'll catch certain things that a man wouldn't have caught or something like that, which it's, it seems totally plausible to me and I can get behind it, but I don't think that's why we do it. April is the best person for that job and Leslie is the best person for that job. We just have to look in more places, mm -hmm. and I think we also, you know, either people are underrepresented or they're not, right? And they definitely are, so there are going to be fewer people uh, who have the experience and the background to take those jobs. So I think the thing that we can really double or triple or quadruple down on is ensuring that we don't fail them once they arrive at the company. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure... Uh, that exact formulation of tech is hostile to diversity. I mean, I think tech lives inside of a society that still has a lot of systemic racism and it's not, it's not like doesn't stop at the boundaries of, of the tech industry, but neither is it especially you know, exacerbated by being around technology, but it is maybe exacerbated by the irrational decision-making of people who are trying to make money. And if you've ever been in a casino, um, or if you've ever like gambled in a casino, we get a little crazy when it comes to that stuff. You're like, I'm wearing these socks, or I gotta be facing Northwest, or something like that. And so you see, ah, Google, Stanford CS PhD dropouts. Okay, now I'm gonna go see what other Stanford CS PhD dropouts I can find, because that's like a hot ticket. Or hmm, Microsoft and Facebook, dropping out of Harvard. So like now we gotta find some other Harvard dropouts. Um, and that's, you know, um, that plus the overall contact with society, I think creates a, a system that with, in the absence of deliberate, conscious, like intentional effort is going to perpetuate itself. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just, just speaking, I mean, this is the most important thing. <laughs> uh, this is the most important thing. Like, the way to create change is hiring people <laughs> and giving people opportunities to have the access to networks and the skills and building up that experience. And, and I totally agree. Like, ultimately, it's about finding the best possible people. But how do you open up? I mean, a lot of people just don't know about the opportunities or don't have the trajectory to have the same baseline to get the skills if you're not tapping the same networks or because of the larger societal, like you're saying, implicit bias or, or systemic racism, et cetera. But I think that doesn't mean we shouldn't focus our attention and effort on that and, and try to create avenues for that. You know, that's like, that's real impactful, tangible change. That's, that's, that's what we're trying to do all the time. Like ultimately, besides creating entrepreneurs and, and changing the larger New York City ecosystem, every person we get from an underserved background into a technology company as an engineer, that only transforms their lives, but ultimately transform companies from inside. And even if it's just an entry beginning position, they build the skills and networks as, as you did originally at Flickr, and then all these people proliferate. Like, every person is so important, and that, that like, I think, you know, I see my own biases in terms of hiring, in terms of growing our company. Um, even though I try to be very conscious of it, I think it's, 
it's, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult not to be. Um, but, you know, being intentional about and thoughtful about it, and, I, and that's why it's great that Slack and other companies are trying to address these issues. Mm -hmm. I think it's the, yeah. the best possible outcome that we could have is that there is this next generation of success. We hired a VP of engineering um, several months ago as part of the search. There were no black women um, candidates. There was no black women who are VPs of engineering, but the hope is that we can graduate one out of Slack. You know, that there is going to be a generation, because um, it is going to be a, it's going to be a generational shift that we can build those networks and we can foster the talent that we find and we can encourage and support and mentor and sponsor, so that that you know, ten years from now, whoever is in our position looking for making that hire can find people. Mm -hmm. I love that perspective because I'm a natural optimist and we're kind of reaching the end of our session. So I was wondering if anyone had any other final thoughts or any final takeaways um, from today or, or things we should be thinking about in terms of using tech to fix our world <laughs> and beyond. Yeah, um, I think that what, what we are seeing is that the guys that now and soon to be women getting out of our program are Music is starting. <laughs> are really showing that um, you shouldn't be afraid of tech yeah. and that it's not beyond reach. That now people are going back to their neighborhoods and we require that all of our graduates do community service. They go back to their neighborhood and they serve because we're very much of a reactionary program, but we want to be a proactive program. We're doing things like Teen Tech Hub in the city of Richmond in, in the East Bay, being led by one of our graduates, James Houston. It's a coding school for after, after school kids, at risk youth. Um, it's not a technology thing, but Ray Hartz, another graduate, going to the East Bay in Pittsburgh, California, opening community gardens. We have guys like Vin Nguyen, who came to prison at 15 years old, served 22 years, and every Wednesday night he speaks to at risk youth. So those type of things are not all necessarily technology related, but we're trying to inject technology into those, um, into those communities, and it's, it's really starting to work. Excellent. Well, we're being actually played off the stage by the next stage, so I just want to thank all of our, pa our panelists, and I want to thank you guys for being such a great audience. Thank you, Jenna, for moderating. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>